Watson. This little guy? Oh yeah, Watson. <laughs> Watson. Get on the stairs. Play your dogs. It's kind of New York. Watson. Yeah, he's Watson. from the fucking UK. He's not Watson. fucking J J J J Jonah Jameson. Watson. Get on the stairs. That was good. That was good. Thank you. Yeah. Yo, welcome back to the movie blog where we break down all the jaw dropping, head scratching moments from from. Today we're diving into Season 3, Episode 9, and trust me, you'll want to stick around because there's a lot to unpack. Let's jump right in. Elgin, my guy, I got two words for you. Go home, Roger. Go home, Roger. Go home, Roger. Go home. Dude's out here moving like R. Kelly meets P. Diddy and it's all types of wrong. What's with the assault, dungeons, and acting like he's a hero? Yo, Elgin, stay back and go haunt your own nightmares. Screw that guy. This episode gave us a bunch of Elgin gooning with a side of madness, Fatima's belly growing, WTF, it's, it's actually, we, what is going on here? One moment her stomach is concaving on itself when she's at home and the next we see a big old baby bump. Plus, she's also getting assaulted by the zombie lady. Sarah hears voices and they're laughing at Boyd, again. Jim and Tabitha reconcile just in time because now Tabitha is developing her mutant powers. We finally see the fate of Miranda when she was running around that night and for the first time ever, we see a monster run. Oh, and the boy in white. This mofo has evolved into a tween in white and he's not about to let Victor chop down that bottle tree. We'll get into all this madness as we break down this latest episode, Revelations Part 1. And man, this show is really giving some revelations about what is going on and what happened. Before we get into the madness, take a second to hit that like button. No, really, smash that like button. And if you're vibing with these breakdowns, hit subscribe so we can keep bringing you the heat and, you know, the from theories. But please, please, please hit that like button and more importantly, subscribe, please. Now let's roll. We open with Boyd trying to keep up with his son, Ellis. Now, Boyd's out here acting like an aging action hero. All grit and no flexibility. Parkinson kicks in mid-search and Ellis sees his dad in a way that he's never seen him before. Emotional? Absolutely. But also a little real world scary. Kind of like that oh snap moment when you realize that your folks might actually be mortal. Cut to Fatima in her makeshift dungeon. Enter the blood-serving Bigfoot with a mason jar full of blood, and guess what? Things go from goofy to downright morbid when Elgin tells Fatima that she needs to eat in order to feed the baby. Yeah, he wants her to drink it. Bruh, and holy crap, did this guy put a whole lot of blood in that jar? How is he still walking? This is Twilight with way more cringe. Fatima's hesitant, but that vampire Kool-Aid eventually gets her and she guzzles it down like it's summer 98. Oh yeah! This show makes me want a barf bag just by talking about it and I've watched this episode at least three times now. I'll do it for y'all, but... Ugh. We then switch to Victor having a temper tantrum and Tabitha and Sarah trying to console him. He's sick of remembering because he's blaming himself for the death of his mother and I get it. Trust me, I get it. I have things that I don't want to remember either and because, unfortunately, finding my mother's body is one thing Victor and I have in common. And I ain't trying to be a downer, but I feel like it's somewhat cathartic for me to share this with y'all. What's interesting is that Tabitha now has superpowers. Tabitha has a Madam Web moment when she grabs Victor by the arm and even has that WTF moment of confusion, but... I like how Sarah notices that something is going on and even asks Tabitha to explain what just happened. She wants to talk and share information. How about that? Now, Sarah has been super interesting this season because her whereabouts throughout the season are a bit sus. She was in the right place at the right time back in the first episode of the season to save Julie and Ethan and then vanishes for episodes at a time without explanation. Now she's here during a very important moment with Tabitha developing her powers and I can't help but think about when Sarah got the message to murk the boy. I mean, Victor is our resident man-child. Hmm. 
Anyway, Penny interrupts and shows up explaining that Tabitha needs to come right now to come check on Julie. We then switch to Julie, Jim, Ethan, Christy, and Marielle in the clinic, with Julie getting a full checkout after seizuring in the woods. Julie chooses not to tell the whole story and just tells them that she had a really weird dream when it happened. And then Christy hobbles away, no longer needing a crutch to walk. Wow, that was fast. Julie tells Jim that she was in the woods with Randall and he immediately starts transforming into Mr. Dad Mode 3000 when he hears that news. Like, you can see the transformation on his face. Tabitha walks in before Jim reaches his final form and Jim walks off in an imperfect Ultra Instinct mode. We then switch to Randall who's about to take off his bandage and show off his Joker smile when he's once again reminded that this beef ain't over between him and the cicadas. Now, I'm starting to understand how From is operating with us getting introduced to the potential big bad of season 4 during season 3. Kind of like how we got introduced to the kimono zombie back in season 2. Well, the creature at the settlement could be our season 4 villain too. And maybe the cicadas are the final boss. I don't know, maybe. Randall is getting all effed up by the cicada sounds when thankfully Jim shows up at the right time and... Huh. The sounds completely stopped when Jim showed up. Jim, he's about to pull the I have a shotgun and a shovel act when Randall actually gives some sound advice. Who knew? Randall admits he was teaching Julie how to drive and they ended up in the woods when he started to freak out. And Randall is actually kind of nice in this moment even letting Jim know that he's actually going through his own stuff right now and isn't really trying to be a dick no more. He tells Jim he told Julie not to go back, but she ain't the type to listen. Jim is about to head out when Randall advises that Jim take time to teach his daughter to drive before it's too late. We then switch to Boyd and Ellis returning from the search for Fatima and Boyd is trying to get his leg to listen to him. Ellis wants answers and Boyd is finally ready to explain his health to his son. Why is it that so many parents don't want to share their medical conditions with their kids? I get that they don't want to scare them, but isn't this stuff like hereditary? I, I know I'd want to know. We then switch to Donna in Colony House and dang, Donna is going through it. She's walking through Colony House reminiscing on that night when we learned that Fatima had a girlfriend. Everyone loved Fatima. And Donna is starting to remember that. We then switch to Jim and Tabitha in the clinic having a heart to heart about, well, you know, about everything actually. And Jim, hold up. Jim is apologizing for being a dick. And he tells Tabitha he don't want to fight no more and is back on Team Tabitha from here on out. It's about freaking time, Jim. Stop bitching about nobody wanting to know who's on the radio and get on board with the fact that you're married to Jean Grey and she's about to turn into the Phoenix, right? You better get on your Cyclops and start getting comfortable with being number two in this family. We then switch back to Boyd, who's chilling with Ellis as Boyd finishes his chat with Ellis about his condition. And he's got Father Kadri's liquor. Hmm. Huh. He's astoundingly honest about how things are getting worse with his condition. And he even tells Ellis that he feels responsible for what's happening with Fatima. After he was talking smack about how this place couldn't break him. And you know what? He's not wrong. Nah, he's not wrong. And how many of y'all started rolling when Boyd started calling himself a gimp? Raise your hands in the comments if you were me in this moment. Out of nowhere, one of the nurse monsters show up. Shit, there's a lot of nurse monsters, ain't there? Anyway, one of the nurse monsters show up and starts taunting Boyd from outside. And Boyd is pissed and drunk enough to actually want to engage with this chick. And holy crap, am I rolling at this morbid ass humor? When she puts her fingers to her head, I was on the floor crying. Like, for real. My stomach. I was, tears were rolling down my face. Ellis saved Boyd's life in this moment because Boyd was about to F around and find out. And I'm getting deja vu to when Fatima started losing her cool in this same place back in season two. Hmm. 
We then switch to Sarah who has, oh snap, Sarah fixed the ornament her brother made for her. She better keep that thing away from Kenny. The second she put that thing together and was starting to feel a little happy, bam. The OG Ghost Whisperer gets her mojo back. She starts flailing around and she's like she's auditioning for the scary movie reboot, asking for the voices to leave her alone. We then switch back to this big goon Smelgen heading back into the root cellar. Fatima is down there trying to make a prison shank when we get a glimpse to see that her imaginary baby ain't so imaginary anymore. She looks like she's about four to six months pregnant. Smelgen comes in the room looking like a proud uncle talking about how hard life is when you're free. Fatima gives Elgin a buck fifty on his hand and tries to slowly run away, but let's be honest, what's she gonna eat if she leaves? We then switch back to Ellis and Boyd trying to figure out if they should go look for Fatima when Sarah stops by to tell Boyd that the voices are back and they told her that Fatima is missing. Ellis is still infected with the angries and is about to F Sarah up till Boyd tells him to fall back. Sarah shares the details that Fatima is close, but the voices are laughing again. And we the audience know that they love laughing at Boyd when he's losing. And who else feels like they're low-key baiting Boyd in this moment, right? I'm thinking back to season two and how they did this before when the cicada monster possessed the cicada three. Now, hear me out. But back then, we thought Boyd won in that moment, right? When he ended up destroying the music box and the three woke up. But now that we know that the three are still having issues, I'm starting to wonder if Boyd is being manipulated into taking these actions. What if they want him to do what he's doing? What if all of this serves the grand designs of the cicada monster if Boyd does whatever it is he's going to do next? This just doesn't sit right with me and I can't help but wonder if it's a setup. Anyway, we switch over to some new randoms walking outside Colony House and damn near getting crushed by Victor's boxcar as he's doing some house cleaning. What better way to clean your room than by throwing all your garbage out the window? The NPCs are not happy, but Victor don't give up and keeps doing what he's doing, including throwing out all of his drawings. Oh shoot, he threw out his drawings? Convenient Clara shows up to see what the hell Victor is doing while simultaneously cementing herself on our sus list similar to how everyone wanted to believe that Tilly was evil until she got murked. Now we can all collectively put our energy into Clara with no evidence whatsoever to make her sus other than the fact that she was born. Victor storms out of the room, heads into the kitchen, and grabs himself an axe with Nightwing and Batgirl not understanding what's going on. And am I the only one who noticed that Kenny had his hand on his thing at that second? I mean like at the second he saw Victor with an axe, he was ready. And I know I'm not the only one who thought we was about to have an Abby moment when that happened. But good news, Victor saved his own life because instead of going psycho, Victor heads out to take down the bottle tree. We then switch to the Matthews walking into the diner as a family. And wow. Wow, we haven't had a moment like this since season one. You know, with the Matthews having a family moment in the diner and the new Mrs. Lou behind the counter making some food with love. Bakta made some curry Elma and Jim goes to go fix the family a plate. We then switch to Donna and Colony House looking at a picture of her and her sister when she gets a visit from Boyd. Boyd was gonna try to talk to Donna but Donna tells him that she's decided not to be the snitch in the situation. Boyd and I are pleasantly surprised but then Boyd tells her what happened and how Fatima is missing and he even tells her that Sarah tipped them off that something took Fatima. Donna recommends that they call a meeting and try to get everyone to help search for her. Anyway, we switch back to the Matthews eating Bakta's cooking, and apparently, they may not be a fan of food with seasoning. Tabitha is chowing down, but the rest of them just seem confused at what's happening with their taste buds. Ethan goes to the bathroom to go spit out his food, and Julie talks about how nothing is normal about this place. We then hear Boyd ringing his bell and calling a meeting. We see Boyd outside, and Ellis shows up waiting for someone to tell him what to do. Ethan comes back with his main character energy when resident problem number one shows up to the meeting as Boyd and Donna start organizing the search party. And it's in this moment that we also hear Boyd give one of his Captain America speeches, and man, 
it's a, it's actually a damn good one too. Like this is season one, boy. This is a you can't effing break me, boy. And he's fried up. <gasps> And shoot, after that damn speech, I'm ready to win the endgame too. They plan the breakout in pairs with Boyd going with his favorite son, Nightwing, and Ellis getting suckered into pairing with the boy Smelgen. We then switch back to Fatima and holy crap! She put on the dress? She actually put on that smelly ass dress that Elgin gave her, letting us all know that she's not 100% ready to stab the hand that feeds her. When in the midst of all that, she finds what looks like a door hidden beneath the room. Wow. We then switch to Donna and Acosta paired up in the woods out searching for Fatima. Acosta gets on all of our nerves with her level one logic and we're all on level three. Acosta starts tap dancing on my nerves when Donna speaks for all of us when she goes off on Acosta and tells her to just shut up and soldier. Acosta senses the mama bear energy and decides to shut the F up. We then switch to Boyd and Kenny searching for Fatima, but Boyd also uses this time to have a one-on-one -on -one with Kenny about some serious stuff. He has a heart-to-heart -heart with Kenny and goes as far as to tell Kenny that things are getting worse with his health, and when the time comes, he wants Nightwing to step up and take on the mantle of Batman. Kenny is reluctant and all but commits to taking up the cow, but he does agree to be Robin to Boyd's Batman again. We then switch to Jade in the back of the bar and holy snap, Jade is climb. Jade is cl Jade is climbing. Taryn, Taryn, are you seeing this? Jade is climbing. He's overcoming one of his fears and he's climbing a ladder in order to make his own bottle tree. While he's on top of his ladder, he gets a visit from Christopher and Jasper with Jasper giving us a nice little jump scare. Henry shows up and asks Jade, who did he think he was talking to? And hold up, did Jade tell Henry that he sees things? Like, I know Henry skipped a few levels, but when he did get this far in the game, did he just know that Jade was having visions? Anyway, Jade is almost acting like his old self again when Henry starts to ask about what Jade is doing. He also tells Jade that everyone is out looking for Fatima while Jade is out here climbing ladders. We then switch to Victor with his axe and oh shoot, this fool is out here ready to cut down the bottle tree. You know, the other one, the one that took Tabitha to the lighthouse. He gets in two good swings when, what the deuce? The boy in white shows up and yo, the fuck my guy is talking. And he looks different. Like he's officially hit his growth spurt. Next, we'll see him on TikTok roasting these monsters live from the bottle tree. Is this the same actor? Now, this, this moment had me rolling, right? This episode was so funny. Like, when they start roasting each other for looking different, I was on the floor. Victor's all like, why didn't you look different? And the boy in white is like, fool, look who's talking. Nah, but all jokes aside, right? This episode was so funny. Like, when they start roasting each other for looking different, I was on the floor. It's mainly because he tried to help with Christopher, and that dude wouldn't listen. So now he's just waiting for the people in town to learn the hard way. But for real. Is anybody else freaked out by this guy talking so much? Like, he's talking a lot. I love that Victor pleads with the boy in white to get his ass off the bench and get in the game. The boy in white kind of seems like he agrees and tells Victor to stop chopping down his trees. We then switch back to Smelgen and Ellis in the woods with Ellis looking for Fatima and Elgin getting on his nerves. He tells Elgin that he lost his mom in this place and it kind of gets an interesting reaction from Elgin. Ellis wants to keep looking and they continue deeper in the woods. We then switch to Jim and Ethan heading into the Matthews RV. Jim admits that he wants to get Ethan alone to talk and they head inside to talk. Jim asks Ethan why he told Julie to do main character stuff and Ethan tells this five it's because he has that maternal 10 energy. Jim starts giving Ethan some advice as he seems to acknowledge that Ethan is probably going to be around a lot longer than him and he gives him a father-son speech. When out of nowhere, he gets a prank call from Thomas again on the radio. For those of you out there, look, I see it. The radio is on channel 1, 6, channel 16, and yes, 1 and 6 is 7. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, this logic reminds me of that old math game I used to play in grade school, Game 24. Like, there's a million ways to use numbers to make the number 24. And now this is a method we're using to make sense of Frumtown. Alrighty then. 
Ethan uses his main character logic and tells Jim to stop wasting time with his regular goons and they head out. We then switch to Tabitha and Julie looking for Fatima and they're checking Victor's peach truck. And it's in that moment that Julie decided to open up and tell her mom about what it is that she saw when she went into the ruins. She tells her things with a distinct lack of a descriptiveness and just gives Tabitha the broad strokes of what happened to her. Tabitha starts to process it but gets distracted when she sees one of them damn derp I mean Ankui kids watching in the distance and they decide to follow it. We then switch back to Henry and Jade having a one-on-one -on -one chat with Henry seemingly sober for the moment and using Jade as his bartender therapist. Henry's not sure what to do and he tells Jade that Jade kind of reminds him of Victor and I can't help but think of that interesting comment that Fatima actress Pega Gafuri made in my interview with her about Jade and Victor. I'll put a link to the comments for y'all but th this made me think of that. Jade gives him some bartender advice and tells Henry that there's nothing wrong with Victor and gives him the best damn metaphor for Victor when he likens him to Tarzan being raised in the jungle. We then switch back to Ellis and Elgin looking for Fatima and they make their way to the Brundles. Elgin explains how Fatima helped him when he got there and Ellis really doesn't have a lot of patience with this dude and man I can't wait to see him kick his ass. Like I just want him to swing on Elgin and F this dude up but Ellis doesn't know what we know so he's not there yet. Elgin looks like he's about to spill the tea, but nah. He's rambling on about how Fatima disappearing might actually be good for her, and eh, yeah, right, Smelgen. Ellis gives him that same sus look and tells Elgin that they should keep looking. We then switch to Fatima, who's seemingly finished digging up the hidden door, but doesn't have the strength to actually get the door open when she pulls on it. It's in this moment that Fatima gets a visit from the kimono zombie lady looking thirsty. Oh my gosh. We then switch back to Tabitha and Julie still following the Cabbage Patch Girl through the woods. We then switch back to Fatima and zombie lady with zombie lady deciding now is the best time to put her wrinkly ass hand over Fatima's mouth and well. Oh. We then switch back to Tabitha and Julie and they make their way to the root cellar and wait. Wait, were those ruins always there by the root cellar? I don't know if I remember those ruins there, but either way, Tabitha touches the root cellar door when out of nowhere, she can start feeling her powers again. We switch back inside to Zombie and Fatima with Fatima getting completely violated by this woman and all this creep is doing is telling her to shush. Tabitha heads inside not knowing she's in there and oh snap, there is someone there. It's Victor. And he's standing in the dark, staring at a wall. And I ain't gonna lie, I thought Victor had snapped in this moment and was gonna go nuts on Tabitha. Thankfully, that didn't happen, and instead, he just confirms that this is the same root cellar that we've always seen, and also confirms Tabitha's theory that Victor blames himself. And holy crap, Tabitha is getting her X-Men moment this episode, and it's about time. When she touches Victor and immediately starts seeing memories from his past. Is she psychic now? Or is she a reincarnation of Miranda? Cue the Frumley theories because Tabitha's out here evolving like Jean Grey and this might be her Phoenix Force era folks. This might be it. She starts running off and we see that night that Miranda was running to the bottle tree and she was almost in there. She was almost in there when she gets close to the tree, is about to go inside. Oh shoot, she got attacked by the smiley monster. And what the F is happening? What? Is Tabitha remembering this moment? Is Tabitha remembering Miranda's death? And end credits. Wow, and that wraps this crazy nerve wracking episode, right? We got zombies, we got monsters, we got Smelgen being the worst and still no solid answers. Is Tabitha a reincarnation of Miranda? It's starting to feel that way because she downright seemed like she was remembering things that she has no business remembering. And what the F is going to happen to Fatima? She's getting completely violated in the other room and Tabitha doesn't have a clue as to how close she is to this woman being assaulted by a zombie woman. And let's not forget the boy in white is an F and G when it comes to roasting. Like he tore into Victor's ass when he started asking stupid questions. And he also admitted that he's only been trying to help but so much. It lets us know that whatever the hell is going on that he definitely doesn't want Victor cutting down that tree. And I gotta ask, 
Did the boy White do that to Dale? Did he send my guy into a wall so that people would learn to listen? Like, what the F? Yo, that's some real low-down fuckboy shit right there. Like, these people are out here fighting for their lives, and Omni-Man is over here thinking he's too good for these people. It's Smelljit. What the F is up with this dude? He's over here showing up to town meetings like he's not the problem. I like this follow-up episode after getting some answers back in episode 8, but damn it. We only have one episode left before the end of the season, and we're only getting but so far in getting those answers. I think I speak for everyone when I say, I want answers. I want answers. You know what? Hey, happy to speak with you again. How are you doing today, man? I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. Uh, just got a couple questions for you. Some of them are going to be fun. Some of them might be a little hard. I hope you're ready, man. I hope you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. So I need to ask you, how did the cast react when you learned that Fatima would be eating garbage? Like, was there any hazing? Was there any chunks? Did you try it out? Or was that all Pega? No, I did Yeah, no, the cat, I mean, it was crazy. I, nobody, you know, when, when we found out that she was going to be pregnant, everybody had their own theories. I think I lean towards the nicer side and some people were leaning towards just like they thought Pego was going to, you know, immediately become like this giant monster and eat everybody in the town or whatever. But now as soon as she started eating garbage, I think <laughs> his reaction was kind of just like, what the hell is happening? And a lot of people were kind of like looking at me being like, what's she going to do? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't even know that she's eating garbage. So everybody was just really confused and intrigued. I think, I don't, I don't know, like... You, the very same way that the audience was reacting, I think we were all in the same boat, just kind of being like, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> all right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. So Ellis and Kenny have taken, I don't know, maybe like a little bit of a backseat this season and Fatima and Julie have really stepped up. So yeah. I'm curious, you know, working behind the scenes, how much influence do you get to say, hey, can I have more lines or... Hey, can I get in on this scene? Or hey, can I punch Elgin in the face? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we we don't get any. Um, no, we don't. We don't get any of that kind of stuff. I think it's more so, you know, just the size of the cast. Um, it takes time to kind of give everybody their moment and give everybody a bit of a um, spotlight to remember or to reintroduce kind of how they're feeling and where they're at. So it's more so, you know, when we're not at work especially Kenny and I, we're probably out having a drink or grabbing some dinner or seeing a movie or all you can eat sushi, which we normally do every every week. It, you know, we, we kind of are living our life because we're all in the middle of nowhere in Nova Scotia shooting and then we come back to our apartments and stuff. But yeah, we don't, we don't necessarily have any influence. We kind of just, you get the script and then you prepare and then you show up and you hope that, pray to God, you're in the next episode. And if you're not, <laughs> you got some time off, you know? Okay. Yeah. All right, now this question my fans asked me to ask the audience. I bear with me with this one because they've got some wild theories. What's up with the numbers four and seven? Is there anything going on with the numbers four and seven? They're noticing like the numbers repeating in the show, and now they're pointing out photos with like you, and you're like sitting in between with another cast member, and there's like four and seven in between y'all. Hey, honestly, if that's a real theory. I mean, if that if that actually turns out to be something, I'll be really surprised. I I don't I'm not privy to anything that has to do with that, but maybe I'll go, I'll go back and watch and maybe I'll see if I can pick something up. But nobody has told us. I do think numbers are going to start coming into play real soon. But as far as I know, we're 47. Though, I, I don't think you know, I would tell them to look elsewhere. I would, I would be like, yeah, find it somewhere else. Thank you. I, I've been wanting to put that one to bed for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So I got to ask this one. We all have our theories, but you have way more insight than any of us watching at home. Not really. But yeah, but what? But what? what? What's your theory about what's going on? My theory. Okay. There was a. The, the one theory, I, I don't remember all the details, but somebody had told me that there's a place in America where the Civil War began and ended. It's like the mm -hmm. same field. And I think that 
something to do with that area whether it be you know like whoever was indigenous to that land at that time and you know spirits that may have aris arisen from them are connected to what's going on with us hence the reason that we have a civil war soldier appeared mm -hmm. in there hence the reason why everybody is from america you know and nobody else is from like elsewhere in the world so i think that has to do with like maybe some innocent blood that was spilled during the you know civil war like revolutionary war or something some time period i think it has to do with what americans had done to one another or done to the indigenous people of america beforehand i think it's got to connect with something like that i think so because i think john griffin the creator is kind of tuned in to you know civil rights or like injustices throughout you know american history or whatever and i i think i would like to hope that maybe this is an exploration through that of that through some sort of like sci-fi horror lens that's really what my theory is oh dude you and i we're right there you, too? you too? yeah yeah but listen thank you so much thank you this is the last time to speak with you i really appreciate it and uh man I, I hope to speak with you again soon good to see you man good to see you. all right y'all one episode left and i think we all want the same thing some answers will smelgen get a redemption arc Will Tabitha go full Phoenix? Or is Boyd about to punch out these monsters himself? Stick around for the Monday deep dive to find out. And remember, hitting subscribe is like smashing the bottle tree with us. But that's all I have for this one. Do me a favor. If you're new here to the movie blog, go ahead and subscribe. I'm making my case to get that surprise to happen for us. And every subscriber helps. Otherwise, I'm going to have to check you all later. Peace.